If you have your Bible, and I trust that you do, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5. And uh, when you get there, stand up with me. And we're going to read a couple of verses out of 2 Kings chapter number 5. And uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 9. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse number 9. And let's read down through verse number 12. And then I'll pray and let you be seated. And we'll ask the Lord for his good help. 2 Kings chapter 5, if you're there in your Bible, say amen. amen. Now, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, watch this, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. And then he asked this question, Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Father, thank you tonight for this congregation. Thank you for these sheep that are of your pasture. They're your flock. God, thank you for this family that is gathered around the table tonight. I pray that you would, in any uh, way possible, Lord, I pray that you would eliminate me from the equation. I don't have anything to offer. I don't have any wisdom. I don't have any power. But oh, if the Spirit of God will speak to us, and Lord, if you will speak through us, and if you will allow the Word of God to come to life tonight, then our lives will be changed. And God, I'll give you praise for it, and I'll give you glory, and it's in Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. You can be seated. This evening we have come to 2 Kings chapter 5, and uh, what is somewhat of a familiar story of the story of Naaman. Naaman, of course, is a man that has contracted leprosy, and his life is inevitably not only being affected by this leprosy, but his life is certainly coming to an end because of this disease. There is no cure, and so he is in pursuit of, of a miracle. How many of you can say amen right here that the Lord does work miracles? Amen. And how many of you can add an extra amen here? He just doesn't always do it like we think that he should. And so Naaman is looking for a miracle. And he comes from Syria all the way to Elisha's house. And when he pulls up to the front door of Elisha, Elisha doesn't even come outside. Elisha doesn't even come out and introduce himself, but rather he sends a messenger. And the messenger says that Elisha said to go down to the Jordan and wash seven times. The Bible says in verse number 11 that Naaman was wroth. That's a good Bible term for he got mad. Can I get an amen? Fellas, next time you and your wife have an argument, tell her, say, honey, you're making me wroth. That's Bible terms, amen? And that sounds a little bit more spiritual than being mad. I'm wroth. And he got wroth. <laughs> and uh, he went away. And he said, behold, now watch these two words, behold, I thought, I thought, I thought, that Elisha would surely come out to me. Doesn't he know who I am? And I thought that he would pray some big prayer and work some big miracle, and I'd already be on my way back to the house by now. And, uh, and Naaman is highly upset because of what he thought. Now I ask you a 
question tonight. Is there anybody else in the house of God that's ever been real discouraged and ever been real dismayed because God didn't do it like you thought he was going to do it? That's where he is. He is upset. He is disappointed. He is discouraged because he thought God was going to do one thing and then God did something altogether different. Brother Levi, I would dare say that there are folk all over this community that are backslidden and out with God simply because God didn't do it like they thought. They, they thought they knew what God was going to do. They thought they knew how God was going to do it. They thought they had it all figured out. But when it came down to the bottom line, God is God all by himself. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And he does not always do it like we have scripted it out. And sometimes our greatest discouragement is because of what we thought. And that's where Naaman is. Naaman is upset because of what he thought. Is there anybody in here that's ever thought you had it figured out? And you thought you knew what God was going to do. And you thought you knew how God was going to do it. And you thought you knew who God was going to use to do it. But then as time played out, what we thought did not come to pass. I grew up all of my life in a family with six children. And I was the youngest boy. I had only a sister younger than me and she was about 10 years younger than me. He is still, I guess. And uh, I don't check on her much. I'm a bad brother. But uh, been kind of bitter since she took my spot as a baby. Somebody say amen. But I grew up all my life just about the youngest in that family. And uh, I remember one of the greatest days of our life. Now, I'm going to mess up some of y'all that's uh, this internet generation. Y'all just hang in here with me. But how many of you remember when that J.C. Penney or that Sears catalog would come in the mail? That was the internet. These girls over here looking at me like I am a dinosaur. Stay with me, girls. Just Google Sears catalog. You'll figure it out later. When we was coming up, Around the end of October, you would get that catalog in the mail. And it was about that thick. And that was Amazon. That was eBay. That was the Internet. And we'd get that catalog out and we'd go through there and figure out what we wanted. And uh, I'll go one deeper than that. How many of you remember... Oh, I can tell there's some rednecks in here. How many of you remember when Auto Trader was a magazine? I remember being 14 years old. I didn't have just enough money to buy the auto trader, but by faith, I read it with a highlighter. Circling cars on every page, just in case, you know, something happened, I might be able to buy one. And that's how we'd read that J.C. Penney catalog. I, I remember one October, I, I got that catalog. It came in the mail. Boy, I went to the back. And at that particular time in my life, I was 10 years old and I was a cowboy. You hear me? I'm talking about a cowboy. Now, I didn't have a horse and I didn't have a saddle and I didn't have any boots, but I was a cowboy. Just ask me, I'd have told you. I got that J.C. Penny catalog. I went right to the back where the shoe section was. I went flipped through those pages and I found the boots in the shoe section. I got out that marker and I found a pair of brown Laredo cowboy boots with brass buckles on both ends. Get back, Jack. Bad to the ball. Man, I circled in boots. I went in there and I laid it on my mama's dresser drawer. And as diplomatically as I could, I said, Mama, I know that Christmas time's coming. And I know that you've got a lot on your mind being such the good mother that you are to us. 
and I'd like to save you a little time and frustration. You don't even have to think about what to get me. I've already found it. Here's the page. Here's the price. And mama, you might want to figure in four weeks for shipping and handling. Amen. I laid that magazine down in there on the, that catalog on the dresser and I walked out knowing, praise God, that soon I'd be back in the saddle again. Well, we went into Thanksgiving and my mother's one of them people that religiously puts that tree up the day after Thanksgiving. And the tree went up, we went back to school after Thanksgiving break and on that Monday, I came home after Thanksgiving break. There's the Christmas tree, and under that Christmas tree was a box about that long, about that wide, and about that deep, and it had my name on it. I said, glory to God. Hold on, little Joe. Wait up, Hoss. I'll be there in a minute. I knew what was in that box. Man, I'd come home from school every day. I'd look over there under that tree, and I could just almost feel them boots sliding up on my feet. And I got news for you. When you got brass buckles on both ends, bad guys just surrender and turn their guns in. Don't nobody want to fight a man with brass buckles on both ends. Man, I, I just knew what was in that box. Finally, Christmas Day rolled around. And uh, my mother is also one of them people that is very methodical about Christmas. And I always grew up, growed up, grew, 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 grew. I got older hearing about people that got to open presents on Christmas Eve. I heard about people that uh, had to just, you know, get up and their presents was all under the tree unwrapped. And I heard about people that ran downstairs and just started tearing the box. Oh, no, there was a process at our house. And that process was that you had to, it's probably something I should talk to my counselor about instead of y'all, but I'll just walk through it. The process was that you started with the youngest and you went around the living room and you started not only with the youngest, but with the littlest present. Did anybody else grow up like that? Spoiled, every one of y'all spoiled rotten. Man, I remember sitting there, opening up them little presents, and they'd go all the way around the room, and then we'd open one a little bit bigger and go all the way around, and I was, I was just dying to get that. I mean, there was six kids in our family, eight of us all together. Jesus was already out of the manger. He was a 12-year-old being questioned in the temple by the time we got through celebrating Christmas. Finally, I got to that big box. Man, I grabbed that wrapping paper. I was peeling it off left and right. I ripped the lid off of it and I pulled out of that box the ugliest blue sweater you've ever seen in your life. I can remember it to this day. I'm still traumatized about it. I can see it to this day. It was blue and it had brown leather patches on both shoulders. It had brown polka dots on the front and a green stripe going back and forth. I remember thinking, my Lord in heaven, you never see Matt Dillon show up to a gunfight wearing something like that. Man, I, you don't even know what disappointed is until you've seen a 10-year-old boy get a blue sweater on Christmas morning. Man, I held that sweater up. I'm talking about absolutely heartbroken. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there any of us in here tonight that's ever looked down the road of life and thought, I know what God's doing? Oh, I know where God's taken me. I know what God wants for me to do. And then when you get there, instead of it being what you thought it was, I'm going to need some help. Has God ever give you a blue sweater instead of what you thought it was going to be? <laughs> well, that's where Naaman is. All the way from Syria, all the way from his home, he has imagined how this meeting would go. He imagined the pomp and the circumstance and the prayer and the power and this giant of a refined man that would step forth and pray over him. And when he gets to Elisha's house, nothing is like he thought it was going to be. 
Matter of fact, if I could say this to you tonight, Naaman thought wrong about a lot of things in his life. Naaman thought wrong about the people that God showed him. You see, he has already uh, miscalculated who Elisha should have been and who he thought Elisha was. Look at our text tonight. Look in, look in verse number 11. And he said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He thought that Elisha would come out wearing a three-piece suit and a $300 tie with a ring on every finger and pray some big prayer full of words he didn't even understand and that the heavens would shine, the angels would sing, and Elisha would touch him and he'd be instantly healed. But when he comes to Elisha's house, Elisha's in there baking a pan of biscuits and drinking a cup of coffee and Elisha wouldn't even come out to see him. And now he's mad about it. And he says, this isn't how I thought it was going to happen. Can I say something to you? I believe Elisha didn't come outside because Elisha wanted Naaman to know that if there was any healing going to take place, it wasn't going to be because of Elisha. It was going to be because of the God of Elisha. Let me just stop and say this right here. I thank God for good men. I thank God for men of God. I thank God for godly men. But the Lord have mercy on us if we've got more confidence in men than we do in God. And I believe, Brother Levi, I believe that if we're not careful, we'll have a Christian celebrity mentality in the church. And there's some folk only get excited when their favorite preacher comes to town. They only shout when their favorite singers are singing their favorite song. But let me say something to you. There are no big eyes in the kingdom of God. There is nobody more important than anybody else. There's nobody with access that you can cannot have and if your worship is all wrapped up in somebody you're not worshiping in the first place and Elijah wanted Naaman to understand this is not something that I am going to do but if God doesn't do it it's not going to get done but yet Naaman is frustrated and he's thought wrong about Elisha you know who else he thought wrong about? He thought wrong about that little servant girl that pointed him to Elisha. Why, he even took her from her homeland and captured her from Israel because he thought she was a nobody. According to the terminology here, this is a girl that is more than likely not even 13 years of age. She is a child. I'm talking about a little girl. But yet... He takes her and rips her from her family, rips her from her homeland, rips her from her culture, and uses her as a servant, as a handmaid, as a slave. He owns her, and he thinks that she is a nobody. But as time plays out, come to find out, she's the biggest somebody of his life. I'd like to remind you, it wasn't the king of Syria that sent him over there to Elisha. It wasn't any of the other captains in the Syrian army. It wasn't his highfalutin friends at the Syrian country club. It was not his well-to-do neighbors, but it was somebody that he thought was a nobody that connected him with the greatest miracle of his life. Oh, I'd like to say to you tonight that God may be trying to do something in your life, but you're looking right over the very person that God's trying to use because you think they're a nobody, but in the economy of God, they may be somebody. Amen. Then we see that he thought wrong about Gehazi. He thought wrong about Elisha's servant. You know... It was the servant that came out and said, Elisha said for you to go down to the Jordan River. 
He had not seen Elisha. The only interaction he had had was with this servant. He goes, he eventually is healed, and he comes back, and now he meets Elisha, and he tries to give an offering. And Elisha said, we'll not receive it, we'll not take it. And so Naaman leaves with the gold and the silver and the raiment, and he gets just out of sight, and that servant gets a greedy heart, and he runs him down. And here's what he said. He said, uh, Naaman, said, me and Elisha got to talking after you left and said, we've got some missionaries coming by here in a little while and said, now we, we, we'd never take your offering. Said, but we might could use it to be a blessing to them. And he lied to the face of Naaman. Watch now. And Naaman thought so much of Gehazi that he gave him that offering and Gehazi was nothing but a con artist, a liar, and a snake in the grass. Isn't that right? So let's just do a little review right here. So far, everybody that Naaman thinks he's figured out, he's figured them just exactly wrong. He thought that Elisha should be impressive, and he wasn't. He thought that the little maid was a nobody, but she was a somebody. He thought that the servant was trustworthy, but he was a lying con artist. Best I can tell, everybody Naaman tried to figure out, he figured them out just wrong. Well, let's just come down here to where we live. You ever thought you've had somebody figure out? <laughs> I better get back up here for this. I don't know how it's going to go over. Boy, I have. I've been church, same church 16 years. Brother Levi, I've looked at some of them and thought, they'll be there till the end. Then I found out the end was a whole lot sooner for them than it was for me. And I had some, I thought, boy, they'll stand right there beside me. And trouble come, and they're standing against me. I've had some that I thought would be behind me, and sure enough, they was behind me. So far back behind me, I couldn't find them when I needed them. And then I've had people that I thought, well, they won't make it six months. And ten years later, they're still on the firing line, plugging away for the glory of God. I've had people that I thought, I can't trust them. Then find out they've been fighting for me in the background. I'm just trying to tell you tonight, you ought to be real careful how much, well, glory, you ought to be real careful how much stock you put in people because so many times when we lean unto our own understanding, we'll be just like Naaman and we will have thought wrong about the people that God sends us. Number two, he thought wrong about the people that God showed him but number two, and I'll just touch this one briefly, and I want to show you my third thought, but I want you to notice that he thought wrong about the place that God sent him. The Lord said to go to Jordan. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but 2 Kings chapter 5 was written right before the EPA was put into power. Can I get an amen right there? Just right before that. Google that too, girls. You'll figure that one out in a little bit. So, the Jordan River was not a pristine, beautiful body of water. As a matter of fact, if it was anything, it was equivalent to the local landfill. It's where they put their garbage. It's where they put their refuge. It's where they put even their waste. And the bodies of, of dead animals was dumped in the Jordan and down the stream it would go. And it was polluted. And Naaman looked at that dirty water and he said, why in the world would God send me here? Why don't he send me to Abana? Why don't he send me to Farpar? Those are stone rivers. Those are white water rivers. Those are exciting waters. Those are clean waters. Why would God send me to the dirty Jordan? And I've just come to say one thing about that tonight. Child of God, he makes no mistake. He puts us where he wants us. And he's got a plan for us. And it's not about the place. It's about obedience to God and staying where he's put you. 
Some folks don't want to serve God where God wants them to serve God. And they always talk about what they'd do if they were somewhere else. Or if there was a better... I, I had one fellow tell me, he said, Preacher, he said, I'd be a whole lot better Christian if I didn't have to live with all them crazy people in my family. I said, you know, that's funny because they told me the same thing about you. Some people say, Brother Jonathan, I, I'd be a better Christian if I didn't have to work down there with all them heathen. Somebody said, oh, Brother Jonathan, I, I could get so much done for the Lord if I was just in a place where somebody wanted to serve him. And I've come to tell you, when the Lord sends you to Jordan, you better go to Jordan. He didn't send you to a banner. He didn't send you to Far Pi. You better look at where God put you. You better... You better salute him and say, yes, sir, and abide faithful in the place God sent you. Amen. Uh, Brother Levi, I, I, I've met some folk that uh, seem like they've just been a member of every church in the county. And uh, they come in, and I had some not long ago like that. They'd been a member everywhere in the world. And they come in about three months. They got mad at me and didn't like me and mad at us. And they, 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 they called over and asked for their church membership letter. I said, I'm going to do you one better than that. I'm going to take your membership letter and I'm going to put wheels on the end of it. They said, what are you going to do that for? I said, it'll make it easier for you to drag around to every church you go to. Don't know nothing about staying somewhere where God's put you. And Naaman here is in a place that doesn't make sense. And he looks at the Jordan. Let me say this and I'll move on. Everywhere God sends you, it may not be good to you, but it's good for you. And God knows where you are tonight. You hear me? God knows where you are. You're in the place that he has directed in your life. And you may think that it's not right, but trust God, he does all things well. He thought wrong about the place that God sent him. Well, here's another one. He thought wrong, I like this one, about the process that God signed him up for. You know, if you look at Naaman's journey here, it starts off with leprosy. Can I get an amen right there? And then a little maid, a servant girl says, go to the man of God. She said, you need to go to Elisha. So instead of being able to go to Elisha, a servant girl sends him to Elisha. Stay with me. But before he can get to Elisha, he's got to go to the king of Syria. And the king of Syria says, here's your passport, here's your letters of safe travel, now go to the king of Israel. Y'all with me? Then the king of Israel says, okay, stamps them, approves them, and the king of Israel says, go down to Elisha's house. And when he gets to Elisha's house, Elisha does not come outside. Rather, a servant comes to him. And the servant says, go to the Jordan. And not only go to the Jordan, but when you get there, dip down seven times. Now, I'm going to need some honest amens right here. If I'm naming, I would kind of feel like I'm getting the runaround. I'm going to need some help right here. I know, I know y'all been in church all week long, but I'm going to need some help right here. And you know what I'm about to say is the truth. God could have healed Naaman any way he wanted to. He could have healed Naaman anywhere he wanted to. You remember the man that came to Jesus in the New Testament said, Lord, we need a miracle, we need a resurrection, we need a healing, and you don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word and it'll be done. Why, the Lord could have just spoke the word. Elisha could have just spoke the word. And Naaman could have been healed in Syria. But yet, he goes from one place to the other, from one person to the other, from one spot to the next, and this process is long, and this process is confusing 
and it is somewhat aggravating. Naaman is a man that's used to results, but yet here he is going here, and they're sending him there, and they're sending him over here, and now he's got to go do this, and he feels like he's getting shuffled around and getting the run around. I just turned 40 at the end of August. Y'all pray for me, I'm getting old. Can I get a witness right there? I'm thinking about retiring. Y'all help me figure out how to do that, and I will, okay? I I know I've entered into a new phase of my life after turning 40 because I went and visited my mom and my daddy. My daddy's 73. My mother just turned 72. And Brother Levi, I went and visited my mom and daddy, and I know that I'm in a different era of life because we sat on the front porch and talked about our doctor visits for an hour and a half. That's a different level. I need a witness right there. Things is changing. We sat and we talked about our doctor visits for an hour and a half. And you know, there's one thing about going to the doctor. It ought to be a clue what you're in for because they don't call us customers. They call us patients. And the reason is because you're going to need a lot of that in the process. I went to the doctor several weeks ago and I had an appointment for one o'clock. But how many of you know that the doctor did not have an appointment for one o'clock? I had an appointment for one o'clock. I got there at one just like I was supposed to. I walked in the lobby, the foyer of that little doctor's office. I went to the desk and checked in and it amazes me It doesn't matter what's wrong with you. You could be on the ragged edge of death. I mean, your arm hanging by a ligament, your life weighing in the balance, Jordan's chilly waters washing up around your ankles, and that woman go hand you a clipboard with 485 papers on it and say, fill this out, bring it back. And here I am about to die, And you want to know when my mother's grandma had her last tetanus shot. I'm sorry, I don't really keep that kind of information on hand. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. You go there and you sit down and you fill out that that, that, that paper, that, that, that clipboard and all them papers. And you bring it back and you turn it in and you think, okay, I'm fixing to see the doctor. But now, I done tried to tell you, he ain't even there. He's on the ninth green right now somewhere. Pew. You sit down, you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait. And you go up there and ask them if they forgot about you. And then you go sit back down, and you wait, and you wait. And in a little while, they give you a false glimpse of hope. Now look, I can tell by looking, I can tell by looking, there ain't no doctors in here, but there might be some nurses and there might be some medical folk here and you just gonna have to nod your little head up and down because you know I'm telling the gospel truth right now. They call your name and you think this is it. But see, they've done got smart down there and now they take you to the back and they weigh you, and I don't really understand that, because if I have an earache, what does it matter what I weigh? (laughs) And they weigh you and take your temperature and your blood pressure and all of that, and you think this is it, but really what they're doing is they're taking you to another room, and you're still waiting, but you're just waiting in a different room and you feel like you're making progress, but you're still just sitting there waiting. (laughs) And then the doctor, they take you out of that second waiting room, and they take you to a room to be seen. And here's a clue, when you go in that room to be seen, and there's a stack of magazines in there that thick, that probably means he ain't rushing in just any second now. You sit in that room, they got that bed in, and you wait, and you flip through them magazines, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and finally here he comes. And he walks in, and he'll always ask you what's wrong with you. And that's kind of ironic, because that's why I'm here, is for you to tell me. Then they check you out. And then he'll take that piece of paper, and he'll scratch something down on that paper. And he'll hand it to you, and he'll say, just take this and go to the pharmacy. And you don't nobody know what that paper says. God don't know what that paper says. But you take that little piece of paper 
and you go down to the pharmacist and the only person in the world who knows what that says is the pharmacist. Do you know what it says? I found this out. Do you know what it says? It says, hey, buddy, I got my money. Now it's time to get yours. <laughs> That's what it means. And almost inevitably, after you go through all of that, if it's anything serious, some of y'all know what I'm about to say, that doctor will say, I'm going to have to write you a referral to go somewhere else and do all of this over again. And sometimes we feel like Naaman, don't we? <laughs> this don't make any sense. I thought I'd be healed by now. But you're sending me here and you're sending me there and I'm waiting over here and I got to see this guy and that guy and you're telling me to do things that don't make sense but you got to understand something. It's not about the process. It's about learning to trust God. God could have healed Naaman anywhere, anytime, any place, any way he so chose. But it was not about the healing. It was about Naaman submitting to the process and saying, Lord, I'll do what you say. I'll go where you want me to go and I'll do anything you ask. Naaman thought wrong about the process. And I'm going to say this tonight. There may be somebody here that's real frustrated with God because you feel like you're getting the run around and you feel like you're getting sent all over and you don't understand why God won't just answer your prayer, give you your miracle, fix your problem. And I've come to tell you tonight that God's got you in a process and it's about learning to trust Him. So Naaman here is in the process and he doesn't understand and he's mad about it. And he goes down to that Jordan River and one of his servants even said, now, if he'd have told you to do something hard, you'd have done that. So quit complaining, big boy. Get down there in that water and you start dipping. I want to show you something tonight. God's put this on my heart heavy and I, somebody needs to hear this. Somebody, Brother Levi, somebody needs to hear this. Naaman went down into that water six times and there was no sign of a miracle in his condition. Not the first dip, not the second, not the third, not the fourth, not the fifth, not the sixth. There was not any sign of improvement until he came up the seventh time and he was healed. Now I'm going to say this tonight to somebody. Somebody needs to hear this. We have gotten so addicted to progress that many of us have short-circuited the will of God because we're looking for progress and God never promised us progress. He just asked us for obedience. You hear me tonight? God never promised us progress. He just asked us for obedience. You don't want to take my word for it. You don't want to take Naaman's word for it. Ask Joshua. Joshua, how are we going to take down Jericho? Well, we're going to go down there and we're going to walk around it. Okay. Then what? And then we're going to walk around it again. And we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again. And listen, every time they walked around Jericho, them walls didn't shake. <laughs> they didn't see cracks starting to form in the foundation. They just walked around. And on the seventh day, when they obeyed God, there wasn't a nuclear bomb in the world that could have leveled that city any better than God did after they obeyed him. And I'm telling you tonight, many of us are addicted to progress and we quit when we don't see any and God's not ever promised us progress. He's promised us victory if we'll walk in obedience. You know what I found out about the Lord? is If I do what he asked me to do, he I will just show up and do it all right by himself in one big shot. But I want that progress I want to see that something's happening. I want to see a little bit of lead way. I want to see that we're getting traction. And God never promised us that. 
Brother Levi, you may just have to preach and preach and preach and preach and then out of nowhere, God will open up the windows of heaven. Ma'am, you may just have to love him and love him and love him and pray for him and then one day God turns him right side up. You may just have to keep on keeping on without any signs of progress. But God never promised us progress. He just asked us for obedience. God, if you don't get nothing else tonight, put that in your heart and say, Lord, I'm going to stop taking the temperature. I'm going to stop measuring the distance. I'm just going to do what you said until you do what you said you'd do. Naaman thought wrong about all of that. Thought wrong about the people that God showed him. He thought wrong about the place God sent him. And he thought wrong about the process that God signed him up for. But the Lord healed him. He comes up that seventh time. Hallelujah. I ain't got time to preach all that. But he comes up cleansed. He comes up clean. Hallelujah. He comes up healed by the power of God. And he comes back to Naaman, or back to Elisha. And I want you to notice what he says in verse 15. And he returned to the man of God he and all his company and came and stood before him. Watch, watch, watch. And he said, behold. Now where have we seen him say that before? He said that back in uh, verse number 11. Behold, I thought. But now in verse 15, he says, behold. And watch what he says now on the other side of the miracle. Somebody ought to help me shout right here. Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. You see that? Verse 11, I thought, verse 11, I thought, verse 11, I thought, but he obeys God, gets his heart right. He follows the process. He he appreciates the people. He submits to the place and he comes out healed. And now he says, it's not about what I thought, but let me tell you about what I know. (laughs) You realize this evening that so much of what we thought turns out to be nothing. But I'm glad that there are some things We can know. (laughs) Hey, Job, what did you think? Job says, well, I thought that I was the wealthiest man in the world. I thought that I'd watch my children grow old in my front yard. I thought that I'd be able-bodied the rest of my life. I thought that my wife would never turn on me. I thought that my wealth made me above any type of difficulty. But all of that crumbled in one 24-hour period of time and everything I thought fell apart. But Job would say, let me tell you what I know. I know that my Redeemer liveth and I know that I'll see him again with my own eyes and not from another, but I know that he's alive. Oh, I've come to tell you tonight, so much of what we think is not as sure as we think that it is. Child of God, get your hope, get your confidence out of what you think and anchor it in what we know. How about it, Paul? What would you say? Paul said, the Lord saved me miraculously, sent me all over the world preaching the gospel. And I thought it was going to be a wonderful journey until I got stoned literally out of life. I got lowered off the side of a wall, running for fear of death. I got shipwrecked, washed up on an island, bit by a snake, and I've been abandoned, I've been beaten, I've been left alone, and I've spent a lot of cold nights in a prison where I did not deserve to be, and a lot of what I thought didn't pan out. But Paul would answer and say to us, but we know that all things work together for our good. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to tell you, you don't have for what you think. It ain't gonna end up 
the way you thought, but let's stand on what we know tonight. How about it, John? Would you like to testify? John said, I slept beside him on the desert floor. I heard his heart beat in my own ear. John would say, I smelt the ointment that covered his feet and the perfume that penetrated his body. John said, I watched him as he took his last breath. John would say, I, I'm the last living disciple, the last living apostle. And here I am, laid up on a desert island, ball in all, left to suffer and die. John would say, a lot of what I thought didn't really pan out. But, ooh, hallelujah. Yeah. But John would say, these things have I written unto you that ye may know that you have eternal life. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, I ain't got time tonight, but I'm trying to tell you, this Bible is full of things that we know. <laughs> so stop being so upset about what you thought and start living on what you know. And, let me say this, what I know is enough to get me through what I thought. <laughs> when what I thought crumbles around me, I can come back and stand on what I know, and I can face tomorrow, not off what I thought, but off what I know. Come to the piano, somebody, preferably who plays the piano. <laughs> That'd probably be best. <laughs> I was preaching in Sugar Grove, Virginia. Don't that sound like a pretty place? And it is, right there off 81, beautiful Appalachian Mountains. I'm talking about unbelievable. You turn off there at the Marion, Virginia exit, and you go off to the right about 10 or 11 miles. Just leave your cell phone at the hotel room because you're going to need a CB radio, not a cell phone in Sugar Grove. Little church I preach in there, Brookside, and you can see the whole town of Sugar Grove from the front porch of that church. Big old mountains just rising up to the sky all the way around. Just a, an unbelievably beautiful place. I was preaching there back in the spring. And I got talking about what we know and what we think. And how when what we think falls apart, what we know will carry us through. <laughs> I thought that we'd grow old together, but we didn't. Now i got to have some things I know. I thought my children would never, but they did. And now I've got to know some things to help me sleep at night. I was preaching, got on that little thought, that subject. And after service, a young man come up to me in the front. I went back, changed clothes, and his first one met me. Big old boy, big old tall, muscular boy, probably 25, 26 years old, wearing an old greasy mechanic shirt, had his name on it and greased down the front of it and with old work pants and dirty work boots. His wife had sung that night. I'm talking about Brother Levi Unusual, just in her early 20s, but sang with the anointing. I'm talking about like one of them old mountain women. She had sung that night, and he was sitting there on the second row, he met me right after service, tears already in his eyes, holding old greasy hat in his hand. He said, Preacher, I needed to hear that tonight. He said, me and my wife got married just a little while ago, several years ago. And said, uh, we, we, we found a house that we wanted. Said, we prayed about it. We got a mortgage. We went to the closing. And said, at the closing, some things came up in the paperwork that didn't line up. And he said, we couldn't buy that house. He said, we'd already packed up. We'd already picked out paint colors. And he said, we didn't get it. And he said, boy, we're so disappointed. We thought that was the house for us. He said, shortly after that, he said there was a position came available at work. And said, I was told by my boss to put in for it that they wanted me for that job. Been more pay, better hours. He said, I turned in my 
paperwork and was told that it was mine. And he said the day before they made a decision, they brought somebody in from out of town and gave them that job and told me that I, I didn't get it. And he said, I thought that that was going to be my, my promotion. Then he looked down, tears began to flow. He said, several months ago, he said, I came home from work. And he said, my little wife was so excited to tell me that we was expecting. He said, preacher, just this week, he said, she went to the doctor for just a routine checkup. And they couldn't find a heartbeat. And he said, the baby's passed. And he stood there in front of that little church, tears just streaming down his face. And he said, so much of what I thought over the last year has completely let me down. But he said, Brother Jonathan, what I know is enough to get me through what I thought. And there's some in here tonight that if we'd have interviewed you 20 years ago, what you thought, boy, it's fell to the wayside, hadn't it? Thought wrong about people, haven't we? <laughs> I have. Thought wrong about places. Thought wrong about the process. And tonight, maybe you're sitting here confused as you can be, saying, Lord, I thought, I thought. And there comes an answer back from heaven. Lean not under thine own understanding. <laughs> Woo! But in all thy ways, it not. I know, I know. Brother Levi, what I know, what I know is enough to get me through what I thought. What you know will go with you to the funeral home. It'll walk with you down the floor of the cancer ward. It'll sit with you in the midnight hour as you weep over broken friendships and lost relationships. Stand up with me tonight. Would you come? Would you find a place around this altar and say, Lord, so much of what I thought has left me discouraged. But tonight I want to come and I want to stand on what I know. Some of you need to come and ask God's forgiveness because you've been living for progress. He never promised progress. He's only promised obedience.